Welcome back to Applied Machine Learning. We are now at lecture 10 of our course. In the previous lecture, we saw new and important machine learning algorithms called support vector machines. And in this lecture, we're going to continue looking at support vector machines as well. And we're going to look at a new approach at a new uh, way of formulating the maximum margin problem uh, that is going to be very interesting and that will be used uh, also in the next lecture in a different kind of context. Uh, but it is also going to be another important and uh, widely used way of uh, finding um, of finding solutions that have a high margin and is going to be another way that is used a lot to solve the support vector machine problem. And in many support vector machine problems, this approach is indeed used. And the name of this approach, uh, so here I, I am calling the lecture dual, for, dual formulation of support vector machines. And uh, we're going to use a type of, um, uh, we're going to use a set of concepts in optimization, uh, which are called Lagrange duality in order to define a new version of the optimization problem that we had in the earlier uh, lecture. So in this uh, video, I would like to start with uh, the general mathematical concept of Lagrange duality. And uh, then in the next videos, we are going to apply this concept to support vector machines and derive new algorithms and new formulations for support vector machines. So Lagrange duality is actually a really, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fairly advanced mathematical uh, concept. Uh, and it's okay if you don't follow uh, all the details in this uh, video. Uh, and in the end, I will tell you the, or in the end and throughout this video, I will tell you what are the most important parts. Uh, and also I will keep it as a, at a relatively high level, uh, but still it's a really important uh, concept in both optimization and also in its applications to machine learning. Uh, and you should be aware of what Lagrange duality is. Uh, and it will also make, uh, it'll make it a little bit easier to understand the, uh, the, the contents of the following several videos. So recall that in the earlier lectures, we were, uh, we looked at support vector machines and we defined the support vector machine uh, as the solution to a number of optimization problems. One of them was the following constrained optimization problem. So here we are looking for, uh, for a separating hyperplane theta with a small L2 norm and uh, such that all the examples are classified correctly. And this will lead to uh, this, this hyperplane will be the one with the maximum margin. But the, the reason I'm bringing this up again is that we have formulated our, uh, we have formulated the SVM as solving a constraint optimization problem. And Lagrange duality is an interesting proper, is a set of interesting properties of constraint optimization problems that we're going to look at first in a general way in this video, and then we're going to apply them to support vector machines in the next video. So first, let's look at a general constraint optimization problem in which we are optimizing over some objective J under a set of constraints, which I'm denoting here by CK. So C is just some function from the space of theta uh, that maps into the real numbers, and uh, our constraint is that this CK is less than zero. So this can be something uh, simple, such as uh, theta is, you know, the norm of theta is less than zero, or some linear combination of the features of, of the components of theta is less than zero. Um, if we have a linear, and uh, sorry, if we want to, if, even though, even though these are, even though these are inequalities, we can also formulate equalities in this framework if we have, uh, if we have a C that's less than, if we have C of theta less than zero, uh, we can also have another uh, inequality that is minus C less than zero. And then if C and minus C are less than zero, then we know that C has to equal zero. So we can also formulate constraints of this form, uh, equality constraints of this form. Um, if C is less than some number, 
even though this is zero here, it can be, uh, we can just, we can also have uh, the equivalent of a non-zero number here by adding a minus constant term into this function. So this is a very general form of representing essentially any optimization problem that would be interesting to us. And if you think at a high level what this optimization problem is doing, uh, it is uh, searching for theta for which j is small, because we're minimizing it, and such that all the CKs are negative. So that is the high level goal of this optimization problem that I have just defined. This uh, particular formulation is not the only one that can help us reach this goal that I just described. Another way of doing this would be to have an optimization problem that's minimizing a function of this form. Here I have simply uh, added, so here I have my objective j, and then I have added my constraint functions into the objective function, and I have added a multiplier lambda that is non-negative and, uh, and that measures the importance of these extra terms. And the way to, in, to interpret this uh, step of adding these constraints is that we're going to be penalizing large values of C and therefore if we add them into the objective function that we're minimizing, we are going to be choosing theta that both minimize our objective and for which the value of the constraint function is small. So if lambda is greater than zero, since we're minimizing, since we're going to be minimizing this function, we're going to be penalizing large values of c. So we will be looking for thetas for which c is small. And for <clears throat> large enough penalty terms lambda, if we put enough weight on this term, no c will be positive and so we're going to have a valid solution when, uh, in terms, uh, where, where valid means that these constraints are going to be less than zero. And since we're also minimizing the objective, we're going to have reasonably small value for this objective. And so now we're going to have a solution that is generally similar to, uh, to what we had uh, earlier. So constraints are satisfied, j is small, but we're achieving it in a different way. We're achieving it via penalties. So penalties are another way of enforcing constraints, at least to some degree. Uh, and this approach of formulating constraints as penalties is, is, the, is the heart of the Lagrangian approach. It is, uh, it is the, it is kind of the, it is the high level approach that we take uh, when we work uh, with uh, Lagrangians and Lagrangian's duality, Lagrangian duality. And uh, in the rest of this video, I'm going to refer to these terms by certain names. So I'm going to refer uh, to the lambdas. By the way, I have one lambda per constraint and each lambda is non-negative. So lambda is a vector uh, of positive numbers, of k positive numbers. And uh, I'm going to refer to these lambdas as Lagrange multipliers. And then this function, which is our objective plus this penalty term, that is called the Lagrangian function. So lambda here is the Lagrangian. These are, these are terms which, are, uh, which you should be aware of. These are standard uh, concepts in optimization. So penalties and constraints are very closely related. I give you an intuitive reason of how an intuitive explanation of how they're related in the previous slide, but let me even give you let me give you an even more concrete and precise way in which they're related. So recall that this is our optimization problem. Uh, it has constraints, and we can define the primal Lagrange form of this optimization problem as follows. So here, uh, this function p of theta, where p stands for primal, I'm going to define it as the maximum of the Lagrangian over the weights lambda. So in other words, it's the maximum of this Lagrangian function, which I described earlier. 
And similarly to how we're minimizing this constraint objective, we can also minimize this primal uh, Lagrange form over the space of theta. And then the really interesting claim and observation, and that's the first interesting results, uh, interesting result in the Lagrangian approach to optimization, is that these forms, they actually have the same optimum. So if I were to minimize this primal Lagrange form, or if I were to optimize this constraint form, they would actually have the same optimal solution, which I'm denoting here by theta star. And this is actually not too hard to see. So consider again our here our primal Lagrange form. Imagine that uh, we are we're searching over the space of theta, and we have arrived at some point theta at which some constraint is violated. So let's say that the CK is actually greater than zero. Well then, since we're optimizing over the over this form which is, uh, so this, by the way, this is still a function of theta, even though we're maximizing over lambda, the theta here is a, is a free unbound variable and we can minimize over it. Um, so if, if, if some theta is violated, then since in this expression, we're taking the max of lambda, then the max of this expression over lambda is going to be infinity because we can take our lambda k to be infinity. So if this, if one of these CKs is positive, then we can let lambda go to infinity, and since we're optimizing a <coughs> since we're multiplying a positive number, uh, as lambda goes to infinity, this entire objective goes to infinity, <coughs> and so the value of this term will be infin. The value of this objective is going to be infinity, <coughs> and therefore we would not choose any theta at which CK is violated, because this will give us a really bad solution. It will give us infinity as the solution. So we would only want to, basically this minimum has to be in the set of thetas for which no CK is violated. If this theta were, if, if, we, if, this, if the solution to this optimization problem was a theta for which a CK is violated, then its value would be infinity and we would never choose that. So this, <clears throat> the minimum of this objective lives in a space where no, no constraint is violated. And now if no constraint is violated, well then the optimal lambda in this maximization problem has to be zero. That's because this constraint here is now negative or at least uh, not positive. And since the lambda is trying to make this expression as small as possible, well, uh, as large as possible, well, if this is a negative number, then we want to multiply this negative num number by zero in order to make this entire expression larger. So when the CK are, are, are not violated, then this theta, uh, well, then, sorry, then, then if no CK is violated, then these lambdas all equal zero, and in that case, this term becomes zero as well. And so within the set of thetas for which the function is feasible, for which, this, uh, for which these constraints are not violated, the, the objective P of theta simply equals J of theta, which is our actual objective. And so at the minimum, at the optimum P of theta, we're going to have the optimum of j of theta. So in, in other words, when all the CKs are zero, the minimum of this objective function is simply the minimum of the original objective function. And therefore, uh, the solution to the minimum of the primal Lagrange form is the minimum of our initial optimization problem. This is a clever uh, way of, uh, of formulating our original constraint optimization problem. Now, given uh, a primal optimization problem, which I've been denoting by P, it is always possible to come up with a different objective function, a different optimization problem, which is called the Lagrange dual, and is denoted by D. So D here is a function of lambda, and we obtain this function by taking our Lagrangian and changing the order of the max and the min. So before here, if you recall, 
in the in the primal so so the, so here we are minimizing the primal and the primal is the maximum over all the lambdas now let's say that we flip the min and the max and we consider and we call this uh, inner minimization problem over theta the result of this inner minimiz minimization problem is a function of lambda and we're going to denote this by d of lambda and now we can then consider maximizing this function d of lambda and we call this uh, we call d of lambda the dual and th here we're the dual optimization problem is to maximize this dual function d so this is another optimization problem that we can always construct from the primal by flipping the max and the min and now let's look at how this is related to uh, to our primal so it's it's uh, it's easy to show that the following inequality holds so the dual will be always uh, less than or equal to the primal and then what's really interesting and I'm not going to prove this but in many interesting problems for example in linear optimization and in other kinds of optimization as well these two problems are actually equivalent to each other so in order to find the the minimum we can either solve the primal or we can solve the dual and these problems are equivalent so the primal and the dual are two equal formulations of the same optimization problem and now that should be really interesting and you're going to be and you can now see that uh, given that we have a primal and we can form the dual this is a general approach that we can use to derive another perspective to the constrained optimization problem of the SVM that I showed you in the first set of slides. Um, we're going to use this technique shortly, but before I, uh, before I go there, I just wanted to briefly mention that we saw, we briefly saw an application of this theory when we talked about regularization. So recall that we've been defining uh, regularized optimization problems in this form, where we have a penalty over a regularizer and I mentioned earlier that we can also show that this penalty-based regularization term is equivalent to another form that is uh, that involves a constraint and in fact there's a one-to-one -one ma mapping between the two so it is possible to prove this claim rigorously by using the Lagrangian theory that we have discussed earlier so again we have this view on constraint optimization that's either based on constraints or penalties they're closely related and in the next video i'm going to show how we can apply this theory in the context of svms to derive new versions of the svm algorithm